Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. We give you praise for another time of worship. We come before you excited to hear the word of God. We are like David, we are excited. We rejoice at thy word like someone who discovered something. We rejoice at your word. This is our mindset this morning. Father, we worship you. You are our king. We lift you high. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Bless our time together this morning. Let it be useful. Let it be inspirational. Let it be life-changing. Give us an insight that we can apply in our lives. That everyone is blessed. And somebody is lifted. Everyone is edified. Father, help the backslidden. Heal the sick. Something major must happen at the teaching of your word. We give you thanks, Father, because we understand the power in your word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Put your hands together for his masterpiece choir this morning. church choir please be seated no don't stand on ceremony just god bless you how many of you are excited this morning you just have a small you know feeling of something is about to happen hallelujah okay first and foremost i have a message um, I bring you greetings from Pastor Dili Oshumakinde, the founding pastor of the Baptizing Church. He's on a ministry visit to the UK and to the US, and so somehow during my own travel, our paths crossed, had a lovely time speaking, chatting together, fantastic, fantastic time. He, do, he told me he never ceases to pray for you. You know the way Paul wrote it? Uh -huh. Say so he never ceases to pray for you. You know we were the original church. This is the baptizing church. All the other branches sprang forth from here. You understand? So he was very, very excited. Um, Pimo mentioned Odun's hair. She mentioned um, Sister Fumi Shaba's hair. Um, I want to say that everybody is excited at what is happening in the house here. Very, very interesting fact. All the units, they say I should greet you. Even the ones I normally harass after service, they say I should greet all of you. Amen? Please, a round of applause for our media and e-church units. They were asking me, how did you people do it? How come you people can't stream? All the other churches are learning. So they are now trying to buy the same equipment we have. So you understand? I mean, we are... Let's give ourselves another round of applause. Um, I want to specifically credit um, media as well because a few weeks ago we had our Father's Day service. The clip from that service, somebody put it on satellite TV. And we've been getting very, very good feedback. Somebody has told us how he made new life decisions with his family based on watching that video. So a round of applause specifically for media. Okay. That's Okay, I can see my time. I'll try and keep this brief. Um, tap your neighbor. 
If you don't have neighbor, point at me. Okay, tell him that one hour. Eh? Let's pay attention. So whatever adjustments you need to make to pay attention, put your phone on flight mode, put it on mute, close some apps, take your, your iPad, your Techno, your, your Galaxy, whatever it is, make adjustments. adjustments. Amen? Okay, not school folks, how far now? Welcome back. I won't lie, we missed you. I'm telling you, we really, really missed you. So welcome back. Um, yes. So, um, how many of you have been in church in the last two weeks? Raise your hand now. See, we are going to be engaging like this. That's why I said pay attention. If I ask question and you stand up at the wrong time. <laughs> how many of you have been in church in the last few weeks? So what's the title of the series we are doing now? Are you sure? Okay, what's the subtitle? Meobo? Media, why are you giving people expo? Okay. So Pastor Christ started a series called um, Systems, Habits of a Spiritual Life. And he began to tell us certain things. Now, I haven't been in church, so I had to go and listen to the message again. And you know, it's the people who listen to it two or three times that get the full message. So I was here more than you guys. So I listened to the message, and he started by with one anecdote about how people, how many of us were, you know, out when Cyber Cafe was a reigning business? Raise your hand. I've told you people we are together today. So, Cyber Cafe was a reading business. People now started building computers, right? And so, one of the things he had mentioned is that that business opportunity grew, and then you would sometimes find systems where even though something is bad, it's still working. So, if you have a computer that is supposed to use, um, that's too technical. Let me take one step back. But if one, screen, one port is bad on the computer, like one USB port, you can shift to another one, right? So the system is not working perfectly, but it's functional, right? Okay. Now, he made mention or alluded to the fact that everybody is made up of systems. So you have your respiratory system. You have your circulatory system. You have your digestive system. Now, it is the will of God that everything should be functioning optimally. But you know, for some kinds of illnesses, you don't know if somebody's respiratory system is working well. So you can see someone who looks very, very fine, but he has asthma. Amen? Am I still, are you still here with me? Okay. So Pastor Quinn and I started talking about hab, um, systems. And he says, he said, habits form systems. Were we there? Was, was, is that what he said? Okay. And he said, um, discipline is what makes us form habits. So I'm going to talk about the habits of Jesus. Because that's what we are supposed to be emulating as habits of a spiritual life. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to skip some of the things he said, but one of the things he said that was important was that if you create a dichotomy between your spiritual life and your physical life, that means if you think, forget, this one is physical, this one is spiritual, then that's where you make mistakes. Because the focus of your spiritual life is supposed to influence every aspect of your life. And so, when the time you want to form a habit, there is something called, uh, this is a bit academic, so if you have a pen and paper, you can be writing some of it down. There's the thing called three hours of habit formation. So, one is the reminder, one is the routine, and one is the reward. Amen? What's the first one? 
the second one and the third one. So let me give an example. You set an alarm in the morning for 5.30 a.m., right? That is the reminder. So every time the reminder comes up, you wake up. You have your bath. That's a routine, right? And then you get to work early. That is the reward. Okay? It makes sense so far. So now, you are supposed to do this. That's how you form a habit. Now, what are the things that Jesus routinely reminded and rewarded? The things that Jesus did in that order. That every time you look at Jesus, you can see it as this is something that Jesus does. And so Pastor Kwe had identified five for us. How many of you know the first two? What was the first one? Eh? Oh, sorry, let me push. I beg your pardon? Number two? So what was the third one? Thank you. Thank you. Because, I, I mean, you were there. Okay, so the third one is study and application of the word. Now, you need to train yourself in the study and application of the word. Pastor Tokbe talked to us about how solitude is part of separateness. And then if you, if you link the two, solitude and prayer, they are always together. If you really want to pray, you go separate. Abi? Okay. And so, um, I looked at a number of scriptures around that. Um, let me just read some of them. In Mark, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he... Amen? I told you, let's pay attention now. Tap your neighbor again. Tap the person. You are telling him, pay attention. Okay. Um, Luke 6, 12, it says, And it came to pass, they went out into a mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. In Matthew 14, 13, it says, When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a deserted place, and when the people had heard thereof, they followed him out of foot of the cities. 14, 23, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went to a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. John 6, 15, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were come to take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Anyway, um, the point there is that Jesus was always taking himself out to pray. Are we all agreed so far? So we know number one, we know number two. Amen? Okay. Now to today's message. There's a tendency to get lost in discussions. What happens is that we begin to talk to ourselves and we begin to focus on one aspect. So somebody tells you, I'm a Pauline Christian. I listen to what Paul wrote. Or they would say things like, the, New Testa the Old Testament is not relevant. <laughs> now, in the scheme of things, how many of you know that we, we, we teach the whole counsel of the word of God? Are we agreed? And so that all aspects of the word of God are relevant to our situation. Okay? So, however, even though we don't take those divisions, there's a special respect for the things that Jesus said and did. Do we agree? When you open your Bible, you see it marked in red when Jesus is talking, right? And so we can take that one directly as the word of God. So, let me, let me take one step back. Now, habits of Jesus, when we take them, when we look at them, right? It's one of the things, it's one of the only things we should be emulating. It should not have, this is not subject to debates. This is not something we are asking for. Is it true? Can we confirm? If it's something that Jesus did, it's something we should do. 
Because a lot of us get into small, small we get into the church, one church, and we begin to act like the man of God, as opposed to what scripture says. So the funny example I can think about is, it's an apocryphal story. Apocryphal means that um, it's, it came by repetition, it's not canon. So you won't see it in any books. The late Archbishop Benson de Gausa, one day he was going to minister. So he had put on his shirt and tie. Looked around, couldn't find his jacket. Picks an agada, puts it on it. Shows up in church. And as you know, the late Archbishop was a minister by excellence. Delivered the word of God with vigor. He went out, came to the next service, entire workforce, shirt, tie, agbada. But in this case, we are looking at Jesus. Amen? We are looking at Jesus. And so Jesus started to quote scripture. And we could tell immediately from all the things we read that Jesus understood scripture. Do we all agree? We could tell that Jesus studied scripture. Now, a lot of us growing up, which Bible version did we read? King James, Abby. Okay. So we are all supposed to study, memorize, express the Bible. Some of us still read KJV. Now, please, I'm not saying anything is wrong with KJV. I'm just saying that what we all learned was KJV. So if I say let us repeat the Lord's Prayer now. Our Father, you, you can tell the people who did not read KJV. It says, Our Father, which art in heaven? It is the newer versions that contextualize it as a person. Amen? So I'm going to be catching you a lot like that today. So people, I told you, pay attention. So two things have influenced the English language the most. Two books in all of history. One is the King James Bible. It's also called the Authorized Version, made in 1600 or something thereabouts. We did our How to Study the Bible classes, so if you want to know it, join Workforce, come for Workforce School of Ministry. But generally, we all know the King James Bible. The other um, book that has influenced English language a lot is Shakespeare. And so, you would see certain phrases we use in day-to-day -day English that come directly from the Bible. Do you agree? Like if you say, we are seeing eye to eye, it's from, it's from the Bible. If you say, the writing is on the wall, how many of you know that one is in the Bible? A leopard can't change his spots. Is it in the Bible? Are you sure? It is. It's in Jeremiah. So, how many of you know there's unicorn? You know unicorn in the Old Testament in KJV. So what tends to happen is that as people, we know a little bit of the Bible. What kind of fruits did they eat in the garden? Who told you apple? Open Genesis. There's no apple there. So what has happened is that depictions, um, paintings, discussions have created certain pictures in our mind. And so we have to know scripture ourselves. The same way Jesus knew it. So people will come to you and tell you, Bible says don't judge. But there's a context to it. Are we right? Am I right? And so our position should be like, there's um, a passage in Psalm 119 verse 16 that says, I will delight myself in your statutes and I will not forget your word. 
In Deuteronomy, this is a, a verse Pastor Tokwe quotes a lot. I have to try and remember it. It says, therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. Bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets before, between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Do you understand the mindset now? And so, all of us who are here, certain experience shape how we look at the Bible. Is this true? So, for some people, anytime you say, let's read the Bible, you feel, oh. For some people, it's exciting. If you went, if your parents, sometimes it's your parents who shaped your view and experience of the Bible. Sometimes it's the church you first went. Sometimes it's just the way people talk. But all of us have certain perspectives of the Bible. Now, to get back to where we are, Jesus had a high regard for the word of God. That's why he said that I didn't come to abolish the law. Amen? He took the word of God seriously. And he understand what his part was in it. So when we teach new creation realities and things like that, you can see the flow up to you. And you can see your flow in the new covenant. So, let's read some scripture. In Luke 9, if you start from 9... I would suggest you take time to read Luke 9 and 10 on your own. But Luke 10 leads us to the story of the Good Samaritan. Have you heard, have you, have you heard this story before? Hello? Please, let's pay attention. Have you heard the story of the Good Samaritan before? Okay. So let's put up um, Luke 10, 25. Is it on the screen? Okay, let me just put my own two so we can flow together. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Amen. Amen. So, Luke used some key words there. If you look at verse 25 in your Bible, no matter what version you look at, you see that Luke said he was an expert or a lawyer. Law school people, are you here? It's you people. The guy has a good background. So he asked, and I personally believe that Jesus was a fun person. Because as you can see, they asked Jesus a question. Jesus said, Yusuf, how you see him? If you look at the history of, if you look throughout scripture, there are some things that you see that you know that Jesus was fun. That's why when Peter answered the question correctly, he said, Okutabara. You understand? That on this rock, I will build my church. So if you look at this guy now, Jesus said, Yusuf and Salam. So he goes ahead and quotes and he says, uh, this is what is written in the law. Now, Jesus was saying, number one, have you read the law? Number two, you are a smart guy. So when he quoted it, 
Jesus now said, if you can do what's in the law, you will live. Abi? And this is the funny thing that happened. Read verse 27. It says, but he wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Do you understand what's going on here? If you go back to verse 25, you see a very, very critical phrase there. He says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. So it wasn't about the answer. It was a test. Amen? Okay. Now, this is how you will see a trend with Jesus. Jesus knew the scripture. He knew what was going on around. And he knew how to answer. So let's go back a few chapters. If you go to Luke 3, you will see when Jesus wanted to be, was about to be baptized. Right? Luke doesn't tell the story in its entirety. Luke and um, uh, Matthew and John tell it very well. Jesus gets to the water side. He sees his cousin. Do we all know that uh, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin? If you didn't know, let me tell you now. They are cousins. Okay? You have learned one thing. So, he sees his cousin. Now, this is how I... You know, I was telling you Jesus is a fun guy. Jesus got to the water side, so his cousin. And he was like, Chia! Now you go baptize me. No, now you go baptize me. Oh, now you go baptize me. So they were exchanging banter, and he says, okay, let it be so. You just baptize me. Permit it to be so for now. And so he baptized Jesus. Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove. Are we still together? You are getting the story, Abby. Now, when the Spirit of God came on Jesus, what happened in Luke 4? They said the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness. So he gets into the wilderness. Forty days, no food. Scripture says so. It's not no food. How many of you have done 40 days fasting? Breaking in the evening, raise your hand. 40 days, breaking in the evening. So no food at all, Unko. Hallelujah. But let me tell you a funny thing. In fact, let's read it together. Look for so that it won't be as if I'm just pulling these scriptures from somewhere. So let me just read from verse 1 to, I think that's 13, right? And Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Could one. The fasting had finished. So Jesus could have gone ahead to eat. Do we agree? It's inside the Bible. So it wasn't like the devil wanted to break his fast. Mm -mm. The fasting had ended. Okay, verse 3. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to you whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Verse 9, Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from him, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. But Jesus, and Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. 
Amen? Amen? Is it the same in your Bible? Okay. But I wanted to point out a couple of things from that passage. So the devil says, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, it is written. It is written there. And this is how you know Jesus studied and knew scripture. And when, every time we are talking about scripture, 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 you know scripture for Jesus was the Old Testament. Right? So as he was quoting, he was quoting Deuteronomy. He was quoting Psalms. You remember when he was in the temple and he said, today, this word is fulfilled in your lives. Right? Because he could see himself there. Now, generally, the whole scripture is scripture. Because the way our generation, well, let me not use that phrase. The way some people are beginning to look at it is that you can discard some parts of the Bible. That all you need is some parts. Jesus was quoting old Testament, steady. So he quoted Deuteronomy. That was the, the first time he quoted Deuteronomy 6, 13. He quoted Deuteronomy 10, 20. Now, I know some people went to Dubai recently. Did you climb that board something? Answer now, until I mention rest. your name. So you people did not climb it. So arguably, that's one of the tallest buildings in the world. And so you can stand up there and see the entire, almost the entire city. And this was what Jesus, um, Satan was trying to do. He was trying to show Jesus the options available. Now, if you look at scripture, you, you would see incidences where it appears that they have handed the, the world over to Satan. And so Satan was saying that, now me get this place, I can give you. But Jesus also responded again with scripture. Now, third time, he takes him up, shows him again. So Jesus kept on quoting scripture. Jesus had a high view of scripture. If you read throughout the Gospels, you see Jesus talking about the Garden of Eden, talking about the flood. You say, and it, 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 like the days of Noah, right? He talked about Jonah. He talked about everything in the Old Testament. So Jesus treated the Old Testament like fact. Because one of the things you also realize is that somehow, somehow, we are seeing Christians who don't really believe the Old Testament fully. Like, eh, yes, I believe in God, but it's not possible for a sea to part and you walk on dry land. It's not possible for carry out of fire to come like that. But Jesus considered the whole thing as fact. Amen. So, how do you approach the Bible? Ask your neighbor. Neighbor, answer. If your neighbor did not answer, raise your hand. I'm joking. Put it down, please. Now, I want to talk about how to approach Scripture. Because you see, today's topic is study and application of the word. Now, when pressure came, when temptation came, Jesus was able to bring out what he had studied and how it applied to the situation, right? So there are certain approaches we use when we are studying the Bible. Not all of them are good. I don't want to say they are bad because at least you are studying the Bible. One of them is what I like to call the antidepressant approach to scripture. Antidepressant means that you are feeling depressed. You look for the scripture that talks about depression. So it's like, ah, I have a headache, I take tablets. Now a lot of us don't don't really know the context. You understand? So like the devil did, he said he will give his angels charge over you. It's scripture. 
But in that particular circumstance, it was not the appropriate scripture. Do we agree? Please, are we still awake? So we have this tendency to take a tablet whenever we need it. So we don't know the scripture, but any time something comes up, you say, hey, there's a scripture for it, and you use it. The problem with this approach is that it's a, it, you, you learn the scriptures, but it makes the scripture about you as opposed to the plan of God for your life. Are we together so far? The second approach is called the random approach to scripture study. How many of you have done this before? Just open your Bible. Anything you see, you read. Raise your hand. I say it's God that knows where I'm supposed to read. Just open it. Yeah. And the scripture says, take your son, your only son. You close it back quickly. You now open it. And that says, what your, your heart finds to do, do quickly. But on a serious note, we do this a lot, right? And it is possible, in fact, it's quite common that when you do this, you might find something. But there is no growth in it. Amen? How many of us did WAEK? At least everybody has to. I don't want to say MBA or anything. WAEK. We all did WAEK. When you were studying for your math exam, is that how you did it? You just open. What is cosine? So that means you cannot pass WAEK with a random approach to study mathematics. Same way, Jesus was tempted. You cannot overcome a temptation with a random... See, it is okay, you are reading Bible, at least, because I was speaking with um, the HOD of E-Church on Friday, and so she was saying, at least we did this. And I was saying, look, if you have the potential to have 150, and you say, at least I'm better than the people who didn't come to class, it's not the right approach. Amen? So, the fact that I'm uh, actually reading Bible, I'm better than those who don't read. It's not the appropriate approach. You cannot pass an exam using the random approach. Amen? Now to the one that all of us do is the delegation approach. And as I was writing all this, I saw my name there. And the delegation approach is this. You let other people tell you what the Bible says. So you want to learn about raising godly children. You go to local bookshop. Give me 19 books. Buy all of them. You sit down, you read it. What have you found yourself? Amen? What have you discovered? Now, it's not that it is a bad approach. Please do not get what I'm saying confused. What I'm saying is that the same energy hmm, you are using to go and read on so so, -so blog, then you forward to all your contacts, forwarded as received. That same energy, find it in the Bible, write your own. Let people forward it as received. Or you, are, you come to church, I, I, I just want pastor to talk about my matter. All I need is a word. Absolutely fine. But which word have you yourself searched for? So that by the time I quote a word, the baby in you jumps. 
Because you say, yes, that's what God was telling me yesterday. Amen? So we live in a culture where we delegate a lot. It's our sire. That's how we rule. So that's why daily devotions are popular. Pastor X and so has written out the steps. So you just go, you read two verses, read what he wrote, say the preacher, Lord Jesus, today let this apply in my life, amen, and you go out. There is nothing wrong with it, but there can be more. How many of you want more? Because one of the things I want to stress about this approach is that you cannot delegate all your learning. There must be some that you are learning yourself. There must be some you are studying yourself. If you use devotional, take some time out to didasco. Amen? Because not all opinions are equal. And that's how we learn all sorts of funny, funny things. Because when you read, they will forward it to you, you too, you read it, you say, hey, they are right. You now start saying it. You now see that there is no basis for it in scripture. A funny question I asked some days ago is that, spare the rod and spoil the child. Is it in the Bible? No, it's not. Exactly like that, no. But there are scriptures that we interpret to mean that. That phrase is actually from a poem. So, before you start beating your child and you say, spare the rod, at least find the scripture that allows you to beat your child. Don't use poem. Amen? So, I want to finish on time so we can worship, pray before the announcements. So, question, how should we study the Bible? Now, every Bible school you go to, and for those who did our school of ministry, I shared some websites about how to study the Bible. The approved or the recommended way to study your Bible is called the inductive approach. And you say after me, the what? What is the inductive approach? It's three things. You observe, you interpret, and you apply. Amen? You what? You... Please, I'm not hearing you people. You observe, you interpret, and you apply. Please say it after me again. Good. So, when you see a verse of scripture, or a passage of scripture, what observe means is that you take a look at it. You say, what is this scripture saying? What is going on around? What am I seeing? Amen? Now, in the case I read, just before the story of the Good Samaritan, the way we look at it is most of us forget that phrase where it says, and he tested him. So it was a test question. Amen? Amen? So by the time you observe the scripture, you get an idea of what is happening. The second thing is you now say, what does it mean? What is the meaning? What is being said? What does love your neighbor 
really mean? Which is what Jesus had now described with, and you see Jesus now, he now asked him question at the end of the parable again. Say, which one of them loved your neighbor? The guy was not like, hey, actually, is the, is the Samaritan. Amen? The last one is to apply. And so every time you read a word, look for how it applies today. How does this work tomorrow in class? How does this work in my office? Jesus described an application of the word. Do we agree? Said there was a man who was hurt. First person, a priest passed, a Levite passed. Samaritan helped the guy. That's the application. It's not that if you, the fact that you can quote, you will love the Lord your God and love him. What is the application? So what are the three steps in the inductive method? Please say it loud with faith. You see, once you approach the Bible correctly, it will change you. It will have effect. Your attitude will change. So let's read the very popular scripture we always read. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Are we all there? So let's read it together. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture. It didn't say New Testament. It didn't say Old. And the purpose of Taking this habit of Jesus and applying it, becoming like Jesus, is that you will be thoroughly equipped. If devil comes at you, you are able to respond. It's important for us to stress that getting prepared is our role. You don't, the new life comes to you, right? You become born again. You don't automatically have all the skills. You have to build some of them. So you have to embrace solitude. You have to embrace prayer. You need to study and apply the word. As the weeks go on, we will learn a little more. But it is your responsibility. You know, in the old days, they used to say things like read your Bible, pray every day. They tell you these are the seven. But listen, the system, for your system to function properly, eh? that's why you will now be able to see a Christian, eh? that everything is working well. It's not that with his mouth he's saying he's a Christian, but every time you give him money, there's a problem. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if all your systems are operating fully, you say, ah, he's a nice guy, but he comes late all the time. His time system, his timing belt has a problem. So if you want to know everything, if you want to have everything you need, all scripture, is given. If you want to know how to discipline, all scripture is given. Amen? 
All scripture is given. Let's rise to our feet. Choir, can you help me this morning? I want us to pray a new season of study and application of the word into our lives. Choir in its entirety. Instrumentalists are looking at the singers. Blessed be God. So we are going to take a few minutes to pray. That a new season of that we know the word. That somebody does not tell you the Bible says heaven helps themselves. And you say, mm -hmm. So let our king be lifted high. Oh, so just open up your mouth and begin to pray, begin to give God. You can do the song from the top. And oh, just continue to worship God. Continue to dedicate your heart towards the things of God. The same habits that Jesus had become yours. That you become an example after the manner of Jesus. That you become a person who walks exactly like Jesus. That I am able to divide the scriptures accurately. That I can see scripture and understand what God is saying. For time. Come on, open up your mouth and pray. My neighbor shall have a see the bones of the last of the day. My neighbor shall have a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little this morning we thank you for your word we thank you for this habit we imbibe this habit we use all the tools available to make this habit a part of our lives we set reminders we set we set everything we need to make it part of our routine we want to be so intimate with your word Help us approach it the right way. Help us continue to love your word. Thank you for the whole council, for the whole word, and let this word be in us and abound. 
that we rely on the word rather than wisdom that we do not mix what the word says with with what the world says but we are always on the side of the word that we rely on Jesus as a living word as our example we don't let cunningly devised fables enter our mind but instead we pay attention to scripture we pay attention to instruction father we pray for everyone with, with us this morning everyone joining us online joining us everywhere that a habit of the word a habit of studying and applying the word becomes evident in our lives there's a part of our lives that is yearning for your word oh lord father we thank you we give you praise we celebrate you lord we celebrate your word put your hands together for jesus this morning celebrate jesus one more time in jesus name we pray Can we just say a word of prayer to the man of God?